It's the next level. Is there somewhere a lady could get a cup of coffee? You guys look like you might get down with those little pod things. Horrendous for the environment. You know? Make your assessment, please. Whoa. I mean, whoa. What are you getting? A colossal amount of CMBR. CM. Cosmic microwave background radiation. We've been told the radiation is within a safe limit. Uh, it is for now. Wait, what do you mean? Shh. There are longer wavelengths superimposed over the noise here. I need a TV, an old one, like, not flat. Back to the show, panelers. I'm Mark. <laughs> I'm Steve. <laughs> and this is a spoiler fill <laughs> podcast of season one, episode four of WandaVision and Snowpiercer season two, episode one. So we got a twofer this week, people. Yeah. So, so keep in mind, uh, for those of you that are interested in WandaVision, we'll be covering that first on episode four of season one and then. The last half will be about Snowpiercer Season 2, Episode 1. So, take it away, Steve. What's uh, WandaVision Season... <laughs> so, WandaVision Season 1, Episode 4. We interrupt this program. The synopsis is Monica Rambeau, tasked with a special assignment regarding sentient weapons, goes missing. Pretty I like, simple. <laughs> I like the short and sweet. Yeah, I mean, that that encompasses what happened. Um, but there's a whole bunch more than that. So. Oh, yeah. We we got a lot of answers in this episode, and I'm exactly. loving it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing. It was really, really a lot of fun. So, well, we're going to move right into our general thoughts about the overall as an episode. And my thought is I loved how they got back to the whole blipping back mm -hmm. incident. You know, that we got that information of when everybody blipped back just after Endgame when the Hulk snapped his fingers. So it's set three weeks later, and we see Monica Rambeau. She comes back. Apparently she was waiting by her mother's bedside at the hospital. She comes back, and they're like, no, that's five years ago. You've been gone for five years. So we know that Wanda was blipped back due to, at, at the end of Endgame, we saw her involved in that battle, so this is basically her dealing with Vision's death, I'm assuming, within this whole series. Plus, we get confirmation of Monica Rambeau and Jimmy Woo being involved from the previous episodes that we saw in WandaVision. So we got the first three episodes, and we heard Jimmy Woo's voice, so I'm really happy about that. We know that Geraldine is Monica, and we have, of all things, Darcy from Thor as now a scientist. So I guess she finally figured out her doctorate, and she she's a... She's a scientist, and they brought her in specifically, kind of like uh, in Close Encounters, where they just like grab a bunch of scientists or a bunch of people and throw them in the back of a truck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This she and and Cat Dimmings for me was she was just the highlight of this episode. It oh was just, yeah, just totally amazing. Uh, I I I'm not you know I, I haven't watched the Thor movies as much, so for me. J it's almost like I'm really just meeting the character for the first time because I don't it's been so long since I saw Thor and I don't think I ever saw Thor the Dark World so uh, you know it's it's one of those things it was really great uh, to see her um, I loved I loved you talked about that we got this kind of closer look at when people actually came back from the blip because yes. like it, it, we got a we got it really brief in 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 game and then they jumped to five years 
later in Endgame, yes. and we know that that uh, Spider-Man: Far From Home is like nine months after the blip. So we're we're getting those kind of uh, per- perspectives of it, but to see the actual reanimation of people, the the redusting or however you want to call it, the reblipping of the reformation, was, I think. The, yeah, the reformation was was really, really cool. Uh I love that we got uh, we got a confirmation of the the acronym for sword. So, sword? Sword? Sword. <laughs> <laughs> sword. Uh sentient weapon observation response division. Yes. Um, I loved it. I loved, I think one of the things that I just, I know this is getting into points, but I love that comment that the, the director made about that he was following protocols that Monica's mother had put in place for when people came back. I just thought that was, that was a really cool, quick little line uh, in the show, just to indicate that people were already planning for people coming back. I thought that, I just thought that was a cool optimistic way of, of looking at the world. Cause we didn't even see that, you know, in, in game or any of these, these other movies, we just saw the, the negativity and the, yes. the, the people are missing side of it. So it was really cool to think that someone was thinking positively that these people are going to come back. And was very positive. Yeah. Yeah. Very positive, especially about our own daughter, knowing that her daughter was going to come mm-hmm. back and put a contingency plan into it with her not to send her out to space. Yeah. Which is pretty cool because that's what sword sword is or sword. <laughs> no, I got you doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I had mentioned sword way back when I gave mm-hmm. you the uh, acronym or what what it was called in the comics. In the comics, right. And then I gave you what it was within the MCU. Now we have that confirmation of what it was. Yeah, uh, what it is now within the MCU itself. So uh, I'm pretty glad that we kind of got that 100% information that I've been seeking out because yeah. I, I talked to a lot of people online. <laughs> well, and it's it's so really cool just to see these cinem- these MCU characters in the TV, the, a TV show, you know, and just this this confirmation that all these these TV shows are going to be tied into the main mcu and I, I just i mean can we even call it mcu anymore we've got to find a different name a different word for exactly it, right? it's not a cinematic universe it's, it's, at this point this is now traveling over tv at yeah, this point so, or streaming yeah so we got to think of another name for kevin it. feige if you're out there listen yeah. uh yeah. you need to come up with a new thing <laughs> a new thing that combines <laughs> cinematic tv and streaming together exactly um, <laughs> All right, well, with that, we should actually get into our top fives. James E. Wu, FBI. Monica Rambo, sword. What's the story here, Agent Wu? Uh, I've got a witness set up down the road in Westview, and this morning it looked like he flew the coop. Your missing person is in the witness protection program. I have contacted known associates, relatives. And let me guess, none of them have seen him either. No, none of them have ever heard of him. Something seemed hinky to me, so I took the first flight out of Oakland to interface with local law enforcement, which is when I encountered a new wrinkle. What is that? Absolutely. Why don't you go first this week? Sure. Uh, My number five, well, well, I'm glad we are getting an outside view of Wanda and Vision's world within this particular world, even though it's a television broadcast. Now that explains the recording devices that I saw in the previous episode, and we know it's Darcy that was there because she kind of wrangled all the military, FBI, everybody at the, her disposal that's on site to get a tube TV, mm-hmm. a podcasting roadcaster that's out there all these recording devices to get all the information of what they're visually seeing. And they're only seeing it as like a television series. And there's certain points within the episode where we saw Wanda do things where in the show that Darcy and uh, Jimmy Wu are looking at, they're kind of like edited. And I think that's really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, really cool. This whole, what we, what we get to see 
here, and that goes right into my number five, is just all the, the answers we got to a lot of the questions we've had. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into all of them because I'm sure we're going to get into some of them in our points, but it was it was really cool to get those those answers, and we get some more questions as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been, you know, the, the, you've already mentioned the fact that it's been three weeks since the people returned from the blip, and, and Monica is the only sword personnel who's come back. Well, it's shield, sword, it's all the same yeah. thing, in my opinion. <laughs> right, I think so. I think so. She, I, I thought that was interesting that she's the first one to report. But then she said something that was interesting, and I don't know if you understand what, what it is. She she says uh, that one of the letters used to be creation, or she says, when did we drop the creation mm -hmm. of it? But that's But creation wasn't in the original sword acronym. No, it was not. So what does she mean by this? Do you know, do you have any clues to what she means by this creation? No, I do not. That that is, astounds me. And if listeners here out there and you have an idea, let us know. Okay. Because uh, leave that in our you know the comments below once this episode is uh, launched because we would really like to know. Yeah, yeah. So that's all I. I mean, that's all I had really just, just or and you put it in. We put it in the notes here. What the the comic book version of Sword is mm -hmm. is right as you said. It's sentient world observation and response department correct right and then shield is is the the supreme headquarters international espionage and law enforcement division i remember and this is going off on a little bit of a tangent but i remember watching iron, iron man, man for, yeah <laughs> iron man for the first time and, and pepper hear, goes that's a mouthful <laughs> what, and when you hear yeah and when you hear uh, uh samuel jackson say that he says he says you know supreme headquarters international espionage and law enforcement division in my head i immediately went that's shield you know, yeah, so. exactly. We all did. I yeah. think so. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So that was your number five. That was my number five. All right. Well, my number four. Well, I'm glad that Darcy was not blipped. <laughs> she was a humorous part of Thor in the first two Thor movies. You know, I was mm -hmm. a fan of those. I was not a huge fan of the first Thor movie, oddly enough. I saw that. I didn't go to the theaters. I saw it when it came out on demand or, or on, uh, on pay-per-view or whatever it was and then i'm like okay it was interesting i really enjoyed it a lot of people never really liked the second movie but i do really enjoy the second movie so i'm one of the few people out there that do enjoy thor the dark world and you do get to see darcy once again and she has her own assistant in that movie <laughs> so now she is not an intern or an assistant anymore but someone that has a doctorate in that field so that I think that is amazing for the fact now they're bringing her character in the forefront. She's being part of this universe, and I just love her comedic timing. Kat Dennings is amazing. I loved her in Two Broke Girls. Uh, I loved when she was in, <laughs> the the teenager in the Forty Year Old Virgin. Uh, I just love everything that she does. She she's got such great comedic timing and whatever she does, and. How she loves the story within the episode within <laughs> Wanda and Vision and the fact that she quote unquote and this is part of my quotes but I'm going to say it first yeah. and again I'm really invested in this show I love that I love that <laughs> uh, yeah I'm going to switch mine up a little bit because I want to talk about Dr. Lewis as well I love that when she walks in the tent and the, the soldier the guy says Miss Lewis and she's like Dr. Lewis you know um, <laughs> but it, it was and, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of Close, to, you know a little bit more about the character than I do. I've not watched enough of these, uh, the other movies to be be aware of her. But yeah, the the humor she brought to this episode was just great. And you know the way when she asked for a TV and she specifically says not a flat one, her <laughs> awe moment at the ending. You know she's got that awe moment. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know I, I just I could I could probably go on and quote just almost everything she said in this in this episode. And I want to watch the episode again just to just to hear her quotes because. She's so funny. And she has the really best one-liners, everybody. And if you haven't watched the episode, please do. So just go back. Don't listen to us. Go watch it and come back. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that would be lead me to my number three. Yes. Which would be the fact that we are seeing this real time with all the agents on site with all the uh, old tube TVs as they were. So you could tell that they were getting scraps because you have no backs in the back of the TV. It's an old tube TV, and you actually see the CRT, just the bulb, and the whole thing in the back. So I love seeing that. We we see how they are seeing it on the television, but are still 
so far out of range so that they don't know what is going on. Mm -hmm. And then Darcy and Jimmy are invested in this story, but there's something missing within the story. Like I stated before, it's edited on their side, so they don't see when, uh, when, uh, I forget like her when name. Vision, when, oh, when Mrs. Hart, yeah, when Mrs. Cuts Hart, her hand. Well, Dottie, right. When Dottie, Dottie cuts, cuts her hand, her hand right, right. you don't see the blood, you don't see any of that. Then we don't see when uh, Monica is tossed out. It kind of mm -hmm. blips out when she goes, oh, you meant Ultron. But as soon as that happens, it cuts and segues away. Mm -hmm. There are certain parts where Wanda is like, it's her own world where it's a TV show to everybody else, but she's living it, but she's creating it unto herself. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of edits going on there, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, keep in mind, I think Wanda is doing these things. I don't think there's any external force at hand. I think they're responding to something that where Wanda is having, uh, I'm, I'm, not going to say it uh, any worse than this, but she's having a breakdown and it's her way of trying to keep vision alive mm -hmm. for her own sanity. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It could be, I, I, you know, it's, there's a lot of, a lot of speculation in that. I, 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 I'm going to be honest. I don't know who's doing the, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure that Wanda's the one doing the editing of the actual broadcast that is, is being put out there. Yeah. So this brings me into my number three, which is actually my number four because I switched things up. But uh, is this selective amnesia of all these people around Westview, but not just the people around Westview? Because Agent Wu says that even the the known associates of his uh, his protected witness that is missing, they yes. don't remember the guy. You know, the cops they're setting. Is right it a guy front. though? That's the question. Yes, he I said have. he. He used the pronoun he. He. he okay, I, I believe. Maybe. Yeah, I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure. He, oh wow! That that Jimmy Wu said he. I'll is it her? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I, I think it's somebody we haven't seen yet. Because uh, I think Jimmy, because you would think when he was putting him on the board, he would have identified, oh, this is my missing witness. But he didn't, none of the names that they put on the board. Okay. Did he, did he say we're the missing witness? So, but you know, like the cops, they're not even seeing the huge billboard that is right there in front of them. And then uh, Agent Wu says he gets a feeling that no one's supposed to go in there. And that's, you know, if that's what Wanda's power is doing, that's impressive. That's impressive on a, a huge, you know, that's reality stone bending. Literally, type because, stuff. well, she had the mind stone at one point in mm -hmm. her grasps. And Ben, who is head of the Next Level Podcast Network, he, you and I, Ben, and a bunch of friends, did a live watch of this and Ben has a lot of thoughts and I'm hoping Ben would actually come on soon. So that way he could mm -hmm. vent his thoughts too, because you know, he, he's got really good insights on this too as well. But yeah, he, uh, if you think about it, she had control over trying to get that mind stone out of vision at the time when Thanos was trying to get it from him. And yeah. then Thanos did the whole switcheroo and just went back in time and it just plucked it out of his head. And, I think within that, during that time when she was trying to pull it from Vision to destroy it, mm -hmm. she absorbed some of that power to some yeah. degree. Could be, could be. But those are my thoughts. Yeah. I'm just, it's, it, if she's doing it all by herself, it's very impressive. Is, is it's, cause this is a huge scale of this. I mean, oh, disappearing yeah. a whole town, changing reality, changing people. You know, she put the, when she throws Geraldine through those walls, she then puts them back together. And yeah. How so, did, how did Monica live through that? Come on. You, she went yeah. through walls. Yeah. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Well, we haven't seen we, we well we know that she lives because she opens her eyes, but we yes. haven't seen yet what's on the other what's in the next episode. What uh, what her you know injuries are, or if she has injuries. Yeah. Uh, that was your number three. Yes, because I switched up a little bit. So now we're on to your number two. Oh, okay. Well, my number two would be the fact that we see Vision dead in one scene. Mm -hmm. Wanda left her guard down. She. I think she created vision within this world, but there is something that is preventing her from creating it in the real world. Or maybe it was just something that she just remembered of the real world and saw vision as he was when she last saw him physically. So I'm really thinking that Wanda wants him back and wants him in the real world. And she created this real world, this world within 
this mm-hmm. bubble as it were and now we're getting all this uh this realism and he's becoming more and more aware if you think about it yeah he's definitely showing some more awareness because she it edited when when he was starting to get some awareness and then it edited again so that's why i'm not sure who's doing these editing but uh yeah, it, it it makes me wonder if there's an out uh, outer force that's involved or somebody mm-hmm. within that world that is doing something. Right. I I kind of brought it up before, like with comics with Mephisto and everything else, mm-hmm. but I'm ready to throw that aside and say something else is at hand. A lot of this has to be within Wanda herself, mm-hmm. but uh, and then we have to move towards uh, and i'll go into my other notes about the other people that were in hand i think we brought them up last week but we'll we'll move on to yours yeah so my number two is it's pretty quick but it's one of the things that i thought and i heard the guys i, I listened to a little bit of the guys on tv podcast industries talking about this episode and it's one of the things they mentioned that there was stuff that we saw dr lewis watching that we haven't seen so there's more episodes going out Huh. Than just the two that we because you remember there's a, they sh- they show a clip of her watching with Wanda in the foreground and in the background you can see Geraldine sitting on a park bench and then you see the pregnant Wanda and she's talking with someone else and we don't have any sound on that but that's that's a scene we never saw that is in, yeah in any of the episodes we had so that's telling me that that Dr. Lewis is seeing more than what we're seeing and we're seeing more than what she's seeing because of the editing that's that's going on so that's why i'm not i'm not really 100 percent on wanda is the one sending this broadcast out i almost wonder if, if it's yeah it could be a byproduct of her power but who's i don't i don't know this, this, these are questions that that we've got we got so many questions i feel like the joker in <laughs> batman forever I got so many questions got yeah. so many questions <laughs> Sorry, Jim Carrey, I didn't make a good presentation of your or interpretation of your character, but sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that will lead me to my number one. And I, I really think Wanda is aware of the world that she created with within that world. Anyone that is wanted, she get kind of, you know, anyone that is not wanted, I should say, is mm-hmm. is pretty much shucked aside. She could... You know, I I hate saying it this way, but she she could smell a fart in a car because (laughs) literally she shucked out Geraldine in a heartbeat. Right. Because as as soon as she heard Ultron in those mm -hmm. words, she got rid of Geraldine right away. But she's starting to see all these imposing things that are coming in from the outside world. You you got the guy who was the the beekeeper Mm -hmm. who is literally in a radiation suit and... You know, we saw the, uh, what was it, the rainbow style jump rope mm-hmm. that he wound up, you know, leaving behind. And they all looked at it confusing, going, oh, okay, this is a byproduct of this particular world, mm-hmm. but it's in color there in their world. There's a lot of things that are going on within this that we don't know and what she can control and what mm-hmm. somebody else may be influencing to some degree. But yeah. I really think there is somebody else out there that is intervening to some degree. And my suspicions are still there, though. I, I really think I, I'm still curious about Agnes. I'm still curious about Herb mm-hmm. because they seem to understand something that Wanda doesn't. And they try to get Vision to understand it as well. But they kind of got shut off really quick by Wanda. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. I, yeah, that's all. I, I don't know, man. It's, it's, it's all speculation that we're that we're we're getting at this, and you know, because Herb, Herb is, you know, all the pictures they put up on that board had driver's licenses except for Agnes's. They didn't yes. have an ID for Agnes, so they knew who everybody else was and what part they were playing. They're like, oh, this is this guy's real name, and he's playing Herb. Yes. And this is this couple's real name. They're playing the hearts, you know, so, but they don't know Agnes. And I think Dottie maybe as well, they weren't sure about. Yes. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. So there's, there's just, I mean, as many, que- like I said at the beginning, as many questions that we got answered in this episode, we've just opened up a whole ton of more questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's an Easter egg. I guess we should have just binge watched this whole thing and watched it as a whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
so I, I'm still I'm still on on the, the the fence about whether Wanda's the one doing the editing or not. I don't think she is. Maybe she is. My number one really boils down to just real simply. I love that the show kept the theme of a a kind of sitcom outside of the bubble without without the laugh track though because you yes. know we had that whole conversation between uh jimmy woo and dr lewis where she's like uh, where they're talking about the kids and she says want one and he thinks she's talking about babies but she's talking <laughs> about the chips we have all of her one-liners you know when they're in the we're in the truck and they're all introducing themselves and the first guy says well, we're not supposed to talk to each other and then after everybody else introduces themselves he says well i'm a chemical engineer and she says nobody cares you know i mean it's just it's just all I these that. all that, that they <laughs> <laughs> that theme up outside of the uh, the bubble was was really great. I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. So we're on to notes. On to notes. I think. Yeah. All right. You want to start with yours? You have a ton more than I do. <laughs> I, I do. I've got. A, I, I'm not sure. And and maybe we have a similar one here. But I I don't know if Monica. And this is what I'm trying to figure out. It's probably the same thing with the townspeople. Mm -hmm. Is are they being control? Was Monica? Let me let me focus on Monica. Was Monica being controlled by Wanda while she was in there and she had a moment of clarity when Wanda mentioned her brother and uh, Monica said Ultron's name? Or mm -hmm. was that a slip? Was Monica faking the whole time and she slipped up and said Ultron and that's what got Wanda to throw her out? Uh, I, I'm not sure. And so I, I'm a little confused. Yeah, same here. I, I have that same feeling for the fact that they all they all looked at that footage of her on the park bench and she's just sitting there and they're mm -hmm. like, why is she just sitting there? And then they skip to the next scene where she talks about Ultron and then Wanda dispatches her. Yeah. Well, and she seemed confused when she was talking about Ultron. Exactly. And I think you're correct in stating that they have moments of clarity at certain points. Think about it with Dottie with the mm -hmm. uh, cutting of the hand or Agnes and Herb when <laughs> Herb right. of all things is cutting through that brick wall. Right. <laughs> and, right. And then Agnes and Herb are trying to explain. So they must have came to some sort of moment of clarity and they're going to try to explain it to Vision. <laughs> And whereas with Monica, she, as Geraldine, was trying to explain, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. but Ultron killed your brother. Right. And then it just made Wanda snap because somebody broke through. And it makes me think, are the rest of the residents within that community have the same thing where they're being controlled? Because uh, in the previous episodes, it's all about the child. It's all about the child. Right. It's all for about the, the children. Child, for the children. Yeah, for the children. Exactly. Yeah. And then, yeah. uh, oddly enough, she had a child. So mm -hmm. there must be some sort of outer force that's involved with this within Wanda's world that's creating this. And that's how she was able to have the children. Right. So I'm curious as to what it is, who it is, and who, you know, what they are. But right. with Agnes trying to give that information along with Herb and her not having an ID on the outside world. Yeah. I'm curious if... You know, maybe somebody, you said it was a he, maybe they meant it was a she, and they didn't really want to say anything, and Agnes was yeah. really the person I'm, that was I'm, in witness protection, you know? It's possible. I've got to go back and, and rewatch both the last couple of episodes, because I just I just want to get more clarity for yeah. myself. But yeah, so the rest of my notes are all really pretty quick, and some of them are just funny. I thought yeah. it was a little redundant to say sword response base. Why don't you just say sword base? <laughs> I love that they mentioned uh, Air Force Office of Special Investigations. OSI doesn't get enough love uh, no. in, in, in movies and TV, so I absolutely love that. Being an Air Force uh, retiree, uh, I actually uh, love that. And then my other my last two, we've already talked about the fact that Dr. Lewis is the one uh, who's watching and uh, we find out, oh, but the, we find out where the colorized helicopter came from, that it was Correct. the drone, yep. you know, and then you already talked about that quick vision of, of the vision being all gray and dead. So, Oh, a pretty cool thing about the OSI, though, if you remember it in the original Wonder Woman series with Linda Carter, mm -hmm. OSI was very prominent in that, yes. that show. Yes, it was. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But like, oh, we already went into what I was going to bring up regarding Herb and Agnes and trying, you know, it's it was my speculation of are the people in the town aware of what's going on or right. those people that came in afterwards? Because as we saw in the previous episodes, the, uh, the previous episode with the 
police officers just outside and they were of east instead of west yeah he said no we're from east view yeah. yeah yeah exactly but they did a whole turnaround and they left and yeah. they were oblivious and had no thought of everything but they didn't even have a moment of clarity at that point right that's so, what i'm saying is, is it's it's her powers are it's strange that the people in the outside world are pretty clear you know but yeah, exactly like jimmy and darcy know about Westview and they know, and like, I think J Jimmy Wu made this statement, maybe it's because, or it may have been Darcy, one of them, one of them said, or Monica, or, oh, no, Darcy, no, Monica, it was Monica. One of them said, maybe it's only people that have a personal relationship with the people inside the bubble that don't remember them. So hmm. it, it's, it, we're going to have to see going forward what, uh, uh, what's next. So, yeah, like I said, if we did a whole binge of the show, which unfortunately we can't do because it's Disney plus and they're doing these episodes one week at a time, one week at just, a time, <laughs> just like the way TV was meant to be watched. <laughs> exactly. So that's why we do it. So we're having fun with this one. So I, I'm really enjoying the fact that we actually get to, you don't have to binge watch it and then go mm -hmm. back and then just uh, not spoil anything for later episodes. Exactly. exactly. So with that, we're going to move into quotes. So you had a few. I did. So, um, and the, mine are just, we've already done, I've already done one of mine. Uh, so I'll start. My first one was Jimmy Woo when he says, so you're saying the universe created a sitcom starring two Avengers? <laughs> it just, <laughs> and the way he delivered that line is just, it made it so much funnier even. Well, and the fact that, too, it's like the one little scene that I really did enjoy with Jimmy because it's a callback to Ant-Man. Mm -hmm. And he does the whole car trick with yeah. his business card to uh, to uh, Monica at yeah. the very beginning. And that's something you see in Ant-Man and the Wasp because he brings it up to Paul Rudd's character. It says, oh, you know how to do magic? Can I learn? He goes, yeah, yeah I spent like... 15 to 25 hours <laughs> online learning how to entertain a 10 year old. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so that, that was a comeback and a callback, which I love for this show because they're responding to the MCU itself yeah, exactly. too. So I, I'm really enjoying that. And the fact that we get these little snippets. Yeah. So, uh, the one that I have already mentioned, <laughs> agent Wing going agent Wing says, are you crying? And then Darcy goes, and she, wipes the tear goes i'm invested in the show <laughs> yeah that was great uh and my last one like i said i've already i've already uh said the one but my last one is just again it's another line from dr lewis where she says so i had your goons pick me up a sweet vintage tv so <laughs> that was great <laughs> she's like she's so anti against these guys that, that you know she she calls them out for not having any information and and all that it just i just i just love her. i can't wait to rewatch this episode again yeah, she's she's a trip in it, and she makes the actual episode, I think. Yeah. All right, so uh, those were our thoughts on WandaVision Season 1, Episode 4. So we're going to be moving on to Snowpiercer Season 2, Episode 1, The Time of Two Engines. Hey, Jupiter. Hey. Hey. Easy, girl. <laughs> She remembers it. I was half hoping she would eat you. Wow. Your train has dimmers. You like her? Old Alice has done everything we've asked of her and more. Not exactly the plan, though, was it? Come closer. Come on. Let's see what the years have done to you. So for those of you who are not following Snowpiercer, you guys could really skip out. So we're going to move on to Snowpiercer Season 2, Episode 1, The Time of Two Engines. So the synopsis for this episode is, Mr. Wilford has arrived, and this new threat rattles Snowpiercer to its core. Melanie makes a move that can't be undone. Very short and sweet, very much like what we got from WandaVision, and I really do enjoy this. So what are your, your general thoughts? You know, the first time I, I watched it, I, I, I thought it seemed really slow to me. 
And I kind of wish I'd watched season one again just to, to, to have everything in my head, but I didn't get a chance to. And it seemed to me like Melanie was outside for a really, really long like, time. Show. Yeah. Um, but then on my second watch, I realized that really she boards Big Alice at 10 minutes into the episode. Mm -hmm. So really she wasn't outside very long at all. She just did a lot while she was out there. Yeah. And I'm sure we're going to talk about some of that in our top fives. Yeah, well, uh, just like you, I, I love the the opening minutes, and yeah, I I had to go rewatch the the last episode of season mm -hmm. one, and I love the moving comic transition in the very beginning, just like we did within the first season, and it basically just brought us up to speed. Mm -hmm. You know, we see Melanie stuck outside where we last saw her last season on the last episode, and we get the explanation of what happened to her, because we were left to believe that she was going to die. But they, they kind of scrambled. There's a few things, little Easter eggs, based upon um, even the movie itself, if you, if you think about it, because we covered the movie, mm -hmm. and it had to do with snow and it being too cold. So we're going to go into that when we get into our top fives. So with that, we'll move into our top fives. Jack Frost, get a few nips in. My shoulder. Yes. A little bird told us you've been long nipped too. Alex? Oh. Let's take a look. Open. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh. There's a bit of business. Ah, ah, ah. Lovely. Oh. Cryopathy. Lovely. Cough, please. Sure. So my, my first one really is just that crazy list of things that Mr. Wolford uh, had them get. Uh, you know, he's like six eggs and one hen, uh, a, a six pack of Brakeman's ale, um, you know, and they had 12 minutes to get it, I guess, because of the, the whole, you know, the, when the train is stopped, they're going to be stopped for so long before they're going to yeah. die. But the one that confused me and I, I kept trying to pause it. And, and read it, but I could never figure out what that barrel was that hmm. they strapped onto Strong Boy's back, and he ran ran through the the cars to get it back to to Big Alice. And then you know when the the Big Alice guy looks at it and he he gives a thumb up thumbs up to Alex that it's the right thing, but I never figured out what that stupid steel barrel was. I mean, everything else they asked for kind of made sense. They that what you know Mr. Wilford's trying to figure out what supplies they still have, you know? Mm. So he like asks for an orange. He asks for produce because, okay, the ag car is still working. He asked for eggs because the animal, car, the, the, you know, that, that car is still working. He asked for the Brakeman's ale. That means their beer, their beer brewer is still alive, you know? And then he wants his scotch and, yes. and all that, that stuff. And then the only thing they didn't get was, was the morphine, but they go ahead and, and start pulling the train anyway. Yeah. Regardless. Yeah. And at least they got some of what they needed. <laughs> yeah. Well, my number five would be how Melanie's daughter is so mean to the people within Snowpiercer and her, obviously, list of demands within mm -hmm. 10 minutes time frame, you know, that they had to get it. Then we get Melanie's rescue from the cold with, you know, within underneath the car. The effects I thought were really great within this episode. It just showed the magnitude of you know, the trains, uh, both Big Alice and Snowpiercer. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they're at a halt. Yeah. The trains need to be in motion at all times for people to survive. Well, I get the I get the impression that Snowpiercer has to be on the move all the time. I don't think Big Alice does. Hmm. I, I think Big Alice is okay to, to for stopping for a certain amounts of time. That's the impression I got anyway. Because they nobody in Big Alice was worried about stopping the time the, about stopping yeah. yeah any any time they stopped because they stopped twice but they gave them a 10 you know? minute time frame to get all that stuff mm -hmm. so time must have been a construct so they couldn't mm -hmm. have well, been stopped for too long well they knew snowpiercer because snowpiercer only had so long yes it would still survive so that's what the that's where the time limit came in i don't think the time limit was for big alice the time limit was for for Snowpiercer, because they, I don't, I don't know, but I, I'm, I'm right with you. It was crazy. It was a crazy opening. Oh yeah. Uh, but it was, it was great. Uh, my next point is uh, just Melanie getting on Big Alice and you know finding out 
uh, they they let her on. They have to disinfect her. Uh, I love how she recognizes the guy who shocks her with that cattle prod, but she doesn't recognize the other person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the whole thing with the dog, the dog named Jupiter that uh, I, I think Sean Bean says something like, I, I think I've got it in my quotes, what he says about the dog. But uh, then the dog won't let won't let Melanie go near Alex. Mm hmm. So the dog was very protective of, of Alex, but uh, but he still was OK with Melanie until Alex came in the room. Well, Mr. F- Wilford actually mentioned how, oh, he remembers you. Mm-hmm. And if he didn't yeah, remember I, her, he would have killed her. <laughs> yeah, that's I've got it in my quotes. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah, exactly. He's an attack dog. So, yeah. But the fact that yeah, but as soon as she tried to go towards Alex, then that's when the dog mm-hmm. started to be very uh, aggressive, progr- yeah, aggressive yeah. and protective towards Alex showing that Wolford has a a stronghold on Alex itself Mm -hmm. herself yeah and that leads me to my number four which would be Alex's attitude toward her own mother Mr. Wilford made Alex feel that Melanie abandoned her and everyone else and took Snowpiercer for her own whereas Alex you know she tried to plead with Alex saying I told your grandparents to go get you and you know they didn't make it apparently but she kind of abandoned everything and moved on thinking that mm-hmm. Alex was dead. But apparently Wolford saved her and did all this and then manipulated Alex, if you think about oh, it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, she's been he's been raising her for however long these trains have been running. Mm-hmm. You know, he's raising her and telling her all these horrible things about her mother. And now Melanie can't even convince her otherwise. But it's going to be interesting, the, the interactions between them uh, the rest of the season, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, so my next one is just I, I the conversation between Melanie and, and Wilford before Alex got there, her asking him, you know, how how did he survive? Mm-hmm. How did he how did he catch up to them? And she's like, because she knows his ego isn't going to let him uh, not tell her how he caught up with them. And then we find out that there's this original test track that goes over the Rocky mountains. Hmm. And that's how he was able, you know, he says, I waited, we were hiding out for months in some supply shed, waiting for you to get out of satellite range before we started our rotations. Uh. And then, you know, and then we start this, we found out this, this track across the Rocky mountains, he was able to switch to it. And that's how he was able to catch up with them and then, and then catch them there at the end. And I, even Melanie even says that he knew that she would run Snowpiercer too fast until the point when Snowpiercer would break down and Big Alice would be able to catch her, mm-hmm. you know. And then, of course, Al- Alex comes in and lets him know what's going on uh, with the leadership of Snowpiercer. She says uh, she knows who Roche is, but she and she says the blonde lady from Hospitality. And so she knows some of the people that have been described to her. Mm-hmm. I've obviously been described to her uh, by Wilford. Um, but she doesn't know everything, you know, she says the hospitality is still in their, in their uniforms. It looks like the brakemen are still running things, but there's some guy named Layton who's in charge and all that. So, yeah. And he doesn't even know what a taily is. But a taily, yeah. Well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have any clue. What a exactly. Is. I, I love that. I love that when Melanie uses that term and he's like, what? And then he asks Alex, do you know what a taily is? And she's like, no, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it shows what two worlds they are from at that point too. Exactly. Exactly. Well, my number three would be, uh, well, they treat Andre's girlfriend a little differently now that she is pregnant. Mm -hmm. They think they're, you know, I think in some degree they think there's going to be some sort of favoritism and it's going to move either against or for Andre because he's leading these people. But apparently it will be the first conceived baby on Snowpiercer. And it puts Andre in a position with everyone that is under his command, which kind of sways a lot, you know? And I'm curious as to where that's going to lead. Yeah, I've got some of this in my next point as well, so. Good. Okay, so my next point is just, is Ruth Wardell, Allison Wright. Uh, She was so, you know, like in the first season... I think we acknowledged how great her character, that her character was great and she was playing it really well. But this episode for sure, I really just, just loved how she plays this character of Ruth that, you know, you can see that she has this compassion and concern for all the passengers, even to a certain extent now that the revolution has happened, the tailies are now part, she's considered them part of the, the passengers as well. Yes. And you already talked about that when she finds out that Zara is pregnant, she changes, you know, her whole demeanor changes toward, 
towards Zara. I mean, those two guys were trying to assault Zara because of the death of that the one woman who got killed yes. last season. And But when Ruth finds out that she's pregnant, she's like, no, no, we've got to protect her. And then she takes them to that to that suite, that one car that was, that he, she said, you know, Leighton asked who, whose car was this? Who are we displacing to get such great treatment? And Ruth says, well, it was a couple in their eighties who took cyanide when the, when the tailies took the train. And so she, she wants it to be used. And she said, might as well, somebody might as well live in it. Cause it's here. Meaning it was abandoned and nobody was ever using it. No, no, yeah, well, it, I mean, it's only been abandoned for a few hours. <laughs> well, it, I mean, the Tailies just took the train, so it's not like it's not like it sat empty for a long time. Well, that is but, true. Yeah. All right, <laughs> but but it would have, it would have if if, if she hadn't moved Zara and Layton in there. Yeah, to, and I love that that when they capture Kevin, uh, she she know they know all about each other, and it's, it was just really it was really cool to see that these people, even though it's been years since they've seen each other. They still, they still kept these ties and kept this information and knew what was going on. Yeah, I, I really do appreciate that. Yeah. Um, my number two, well, uh, I really like the second skin that the doctors use on Melanie to help her with her severe frostbite. Yeah. And I wonder if that was used on that guy that walked through the extreme cold when the freeze was coming into the car mm. when he attacked all the tailies during that time. Yeah. Remember, he just walked through it and everybody goes, that was mm -hmm. negative 32 degrees. He yeah. walked like it was like nothing. Yeah. It seems like yeah. Big Alice has a lot of experimenting going on within that train, especially those two crazy weird doctors. <laughs> I had them in my notes. They were they were a little a little weird. They were definitely quirky. Let me see. What did I put in my notes about them? I just said they were quirky. Yeah. The Headwoods. The Headwoods was their name. And uh, you know, Melanie recognizes them. She knows who they are. Yeah. Obviously, she they must have been part of Mr. Wilford's uh, plan. Group. Yeah, plan or something. So yeah, that's wild. So that brings us to my number one. Yes. I, I'm a little confused, and maybe you can help me out. Sure. What exactly was the plan for them to take Big Alice? They have no idea what's on the other side of that door. They don't know how many people they are. They think there might be anywhere between 60 and 200 is what they say. Yes. How did they know that he had Melanie? Did I, they, did Javi, I, I guess Javi. Huh. I guess Javi and, and the guys in the engine room maybe told them that she boarded Big Alice. And so I know Andre they, was, uh, yeah, he was in communication with the guys from the uh, the engineering area of Stone engine, Spear, so sir. That's yeah. the only thing I can think of is that they is that they told him that she got on Big Alice, and then they just assumed that she wasn't able to get on in, in secret. I, I mean, it seems logical that that they would have her. I just wish we had gotten some kind of you know confirmation about how um, how they knew for sure and. Um, you know this the whole thing at the end they still they they still have kevin and <laughs> wilford still has melanie so the whole I, i'm just i'm confused about what this what this plan was. yeah it's kind of like you a know. deterrence thing kind of back in the day I, when I, I have more firepower than you do and the only thing that alice would have would be more power to move the train faster and that's my understanding there's nothing really more unless they have all the scientific knowledge it just, like I said, I just, I, I, even watching it the second time, I'm watching it going, they're just gonna, they're just gonna run through the door and try to get through 40 cars of, they have no clue of who's behind there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All these mutant just, people that, like that guy with all that skin. Yeah, <laughs> it just, it just seemed like somebody didn't really think it through. No. They were just, they were somehow thinking that they were just gonna be able to shock and awe their way well it, it kind of leads me to my number one which, which pretty much it seems that they're all kind of scattered andre and his crew don't know anything about big alice and what they mm -hmm. have apparently they have weed yeah <laughs> but what else than the weird doctors and the power of big alice do they have that they are aware of mm -hmm. apparently wilford longed for what snowpiercer had which was the supplies and pleasantries that he longed for because apparently big alice doesn't have those things right right so both are at odds that you know ha that have someone in their favor to negotiate in some respect i wonder if we get more information next episode where they come to an agreement well wilford takes over snowpiercer yeah and and let's talk about sean bean for a second mm-hmm Man, how good is he in this? He's amazing in, in whatever he does. He is. He is. But just 
just the subtleties of, I don't, you know, just the subtleties of how he played Mr. Wolford was so good in this episode that just, you could, like, there's tension, there's suspense. You can tell there's more going on beneath the surface oh, def. Of, oh, it, yeah. of him. Yeah. And uh, I love how Miss Audrey tells all of them. And, like, he even remembers Miss Audrey because when he gets the scotch, he's like, oh, thank you, Miss Audrey. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Audrey tells all of them not to be fooled that that Wilford may look like he's he's wanting to help them and wanting to just – but no, he wants their souls is what she said. He wants control of them. And, uh, and so it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see this guy and, and kind of compare and contrast uh, the way he played it and the way Andre and Melanie are doing it. Oh no, I meant, I meant, um, Oh, the name of the actor is escaping me. Ed Harris, the way Ed Harris played. Oh, him, and in the movie, in, in the movie, yes. you know, uh, it's going to be interesting to see, the rest of this going forward. Well, I'm, well, this is supposed to be years before that particular movie. Right. So. No, no, I, I understand that, but I'm just saying that still the portrayal of, of Wilford yeah. is, is interesting. Yeah. He is power hungry. You could definitely see that in the way he was well, talking. And we definitely, I mean, this, this movie confirms this, this episode confirms for us that the show is separate from the movie. Oh, there's definitely. Not, yeah. There's not any, any correlation. I mean, there's probably, you know, small similarities to it. Similarities. Yeah. But, but, uh, but it's a completely separate, uh, you know, it's episode. probably more truer to the actual comic from France that, uh, yeah, they had. I wish, I wish I had picked that up. I did. I, I, I read the that. first, which is basically pretty much the whole introduction of what we see within the series. Okay. So uh, it's very interesting to read in comparison to what we do actually see in the first season. But my recommendation to you listeners, if you're really interested in that idea, go out. You could get them on Amazon now. I haven't mm -hmm. gotten the last few books, but there's a precursor to uh, the yeah. season one, which is really cool. So with that, we should move on to notes. Sure. You got one there, and I think it's similar to mine. Well, Melanie's vision of snow when stuck on the floor when she's lying on her back, she sees a snowflake come yeah. over her visor and grab some snow from the ground. It's too cold to snow outside, even though there is snow on the ground and everything is frozen. Yeah. And then she gets on Big Alice. It's like she even states it. It's too cold for it to snow. Which yeah, that's is, what Hobby. That's what Hobby tells her. He's like, it's too cold to snow anymore. But I think. I, I think my speculation on this is I think the earth is warming back up. Correct. So. Yeah. And that's what we got from out of the movie at the very tail end of the movie, mm -hmm. because people wouldn't yeah. be able to survive outside in that extreme cold. And at that point it was probably within its thirties or whatever. Yeah. So most of my notes we've already talked about. Uh, we mentioned Pike and his drug deal the <laughs> for weed. Um, the only thing I've got. Um, Stephen Ogg was great in that, though. <laughs> oh, he is. He is. Uh, I had totally forgotten both times when I watched it. And, and actually the second time, even I had totally forgotten about the explosive because and I realized it on the second viewing, I, I kind of. I went back actually yesterday and I, I started to watch it for a third time. And when I watched it the third time, I understood then what was going on because she, she says to Javi, I'm going to blow the uplink so that you can get control of the helm and environmental back. Hmm. And he says, Oh, you have a sticky charge. And she says, yeah, but I just have one. And then she uses her ax to cut and, and destroy the uplink. Yes. Okay. And so that's what cuts the cuts the uplink. And then she crawls under the train and we don't see exactly what she does. She just tells Javi she has more to do. And it's not until the end of the episode that we discover what she was doing under the train was that she took that explosive charge and she put it on the coupler mm. between the two to break trains. Them. Yep. No, 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 to fuse them. Oh, because remember that's what she was telling Alex: don't do it, uh, don't disconnect the trains. She and and she was trying to get Alex not to disconnect the trains, but as soon as Alex did, she goes, "What happened?" And she says, "I told you when you built this that you over-engineered that coupler, and that anything happened when you tried to disconnect the trains, they would be permanently put together." And that's why at the end 
she says, we're now permanently connected <laughs> because he, she, that explosion fused, fused the, the, uh, the coupler together. So it's, it's an interesting kind of thing to look at because she tells Alex not to disconnect the trains and Alex, but Alex goes ahead and tries to disconnect. Her. So she disobeys her mom to obey Wilford, mm -hmm. but then ends up doing what her mom wanted in, in the, the end, first, which is for the, the trains <laughs> to stay together. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that when I when I put all that together, I, I really I really figured out how cute it was. Which, really, which really means, cool. if you think about it, they're all stuck together regardless within mm -hmm. this whole. Uh, at this at this point now, they're going to have to learn to work together. Exactly. You know. So uh, that's where the season is moving forward to. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So we got some quotes. Yes. Uh, so my my first one is just that that in that monologue that Leighton has at the beginning of the episode that I thought was so cool was one of the quotes he says he says hope was our only seedling in the war of Big Alice forty cars strong versus Snowpiercer nine hundred and ninety four cars long and I just I just I, I got chills yeah listening to that that whole monologue. <laughs> Well, uh, one I would have would be, this is from the lady at the bar when Andre asks for Mr. Wilford's favorite bourbon. And she goes, this is just the beginning, Andre. He's going to take everything he can. Just yeah. watch. Yeah, I think that was Miss Audrey. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, so then the other one, the, the second one I have is that quote we were talking about the dog that uh, Wilford says, she remembers you. I was half hoping she'd eat you. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one I would have would be Wilford saying, now what is a taily? And that was yeah. Wilford is completely aware, unaware of the uh, society that was built on Snowpiercer because he was not involved with that. So this is a whole new world for him. And now with yeah. both of them being fused together, he's going to have to learn that the hard way. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so then my last one is just when she's giving uh, late, when Ruth is giving Leighton the, the mic to make his train announcement, she says, well, speak your truth. That's how they seem to trust you. <laughs> it is I true. Just, I, I love her accent and I love just the way she's doing this character. It's really, really kind cool. of that English Irish mix. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we have no news, no comic news. Uh, I would love to give you guys full of news, but I've been a little lax because of, I'm sorry, well, there was like, uh, unlike, you know, like Snowpiercer, we had a snowstorm. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we do have some podcast recommendations. So, Steve, what what is yours? Uh, the only one I've got, and I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. I've been so busy this week. Is It's actually last week now. Uh, last week's Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum had Katie Sackhoff. Uh, who I just, I absolutely love Katie Sackhoff. She was in The Mandalorian season two. She was in Longmire. She was in the the reboot of Battlestar Galactica that was a few years ago. Yep. Uh, so she's she's really great. She's in a, a Netflix show as well that's really good. And I think they're, I think they're actually filming. Nope. Or they may have wrapped. They, they've wrapped, yeah. They've wrapped another Life. Two. Yeah, Another Life season one is on Netflix. I suggest everybody mm -hmm. to watch that. Yeah, really I would good. love to cover that on Adrenaline Cinema if I can. Yeah, season two is coming up soon on Netflix. Yeah. So check that out if you can. So I got to listen to this particular episode of Michael Rosen Bob's Inside of You. So mm -hmm. I thought it was really cool. Katie was really very relaxed, very understanding, just being who herself was, you know, who she was. And uh, when she posted it on Instagram within like an hour or something, because she was her Instagram is filled of just being who she is, being fun and laughing and doing strange things. I asked her, I said, did you talk about poop on this? <laughs> poop pooping. And she goes, no. <laughs> to laugh out loud. No, I have not. Of all things. Thank you, Mark, for pointing that out. I was like, good. At least somebody pointed out me paying attention to what she says on her YouTube channel because she likes to have fun. And talk about nice. those things. Uh, the one that I have would be The Thing with Two Heads with Sean Clark and Christopher Nelson. And they had Tom Atkins on, who you will remember from The Fog, Halloween 3, and Escape from New York. Tom also was in Creep Show uh, a long, long time ago, the, the movie. And I, I really, they're really a fun filled podcast from two guys that love horror movies. And Chris can be seen in the beginning of Kill Bill Volume 2 as one of the cronies. So he's one of Bill's cronies in the very beginning during the uh, church scene when they go after the bride. And he's a, an, a special effects artist and actor in Hollywood. 
right now uh chris is out in australia filming a movie uh i think he's doing effects for it so he he got out of quarantine and he's enjoying australia and I guess they have check-in points, nice. and it's amazing. So he's having fun. He goes, I can't. I love the idea. All I have to do is put my phone here, QR code saying where my check-in was. Don't have to wear a mask. I could do whatever I need to. Meaning that Australia is really hard on what they have to do when it comes to isolation and narrowing everything down with the pandemic. And it's pretty cool because he gives a lot of insight too within the podcast of what he had to deal with. So uh, with Sean, I I. Sean is an agent to uh, a lot of celebrities for conventions all around the United States. And I've crossed Sean, Sean and I crossed our paths over the past 20, geez, I'm going to say 26, 27 years. And I've let him cut in front of me and, and conventions to get online for a celebrity autograph or something. So I did not know about him until about like 2010 and didn't realize that he is an agent for celebrities and does, and he has his own company. Now with the uh, conventions not being out there and everything is virtual, he doesn't really have much of a job, but he started doing this podcast, his YouTube channel, which is the the thing with two heads with Sean, with Sean and Christopher. But yeah, they have a lot of fun with what they do. They get a lot of people involved. They do live YouTube watches. So uh, Sean could also be seen on horrors hallowed grounds and that is a cable tv show that is out in california but you could also see those on youtube as well and they go to um filming locations of certain horror movies and it's pretty cool and it's really interesting to to watch those and i i mention that to sean a, a whole bunch of times every time i see him because <laughs> i just love what he does very cool and this is the same tom atkins that was in lethal weapon correct so yeah I was looking that up as you were, because I, I think he was in Lethal Weapon. Also. Yeah, he was. Very, very and cool. he does talk about Lethal Weapon on that particular podcast, so I suggest everybody check it out. Nice. Nice. Well, we didn't have any feedback this week, but if you do want to submit feedback, you can you can hear our, our podcast on any podcast player of choice. There are a whole bunch of them out there. Just find us, Panels to Pixels. It's Panels to Pixels podcast, sometimes just Panels to Pixels. Correct. You can find us. We're out there. Give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to us. Check us out. We've got a website that's Panels to Pixels podcast.com. We have a Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Panels to Pixels. We got an email address. You can email us. <laughs> panels to Pixels 1 at gmail.com. That's Panels to Pixels 1. The T-O spelled out right there in the middle. And the number one at gmail.com you can also subscribe to our youtube channel panels to pixels podcast see there's a consistency there you guys <laughs> like you can find us we're out there leave us some feedback because we love to hear from you and to know even when we hear from the people that don't like us and we got one of those that i'm not gonna read <laughs> <laughs> it was but constructive feedback and i enjoyed it thank criticism. you alan for yes. sending that out Yes, thank you so much, and we do apologize for that. But next week, we will we will continue our coverage with Episode 5 of WandaVision Season 1 and Episode 2 of Snowpiercer Season 2. We're working on some uh, interesting little things. Uh, maybe you'll hear some different voices with us next week if Mark and I can get the scheduling figured out. But uh, I'm excited that Snowpiercer is back. I'm loving WandaVision. I can't wait to cover the rest of these seasons. Exactly. And we have so much content for you right now. It's crazy. <laughs> so where else can listeners hear us? Well, I can be found right here on Panels the Pixels, as well as sending out audio feedback to other podcasts that my friends do as well on their podcasts. So you can hear me on an, my other podcast called Adrenaline Cinema Podcast and the Pyrocore Entertainment Network. And that podcast is all about those action adventure films, pure action films, suspense films, and anything that thrill you that actually well thrills you and get your adrenaline going. So keep in touch here on Panels to Pixels to get information or just go to Pyrocore Entertainment Network's podcast uh, you know, webpage, which would be pyrocoreentertainment.com. And then uh, you could hear those podcasts there. We could found be found on any other podcast player of choice so check me out there i'm always here and you can find steve where 
I'm right here <laughs> on Panels to Pixels. I send in voicemails to lots of other podcasts that our friends do. Sometimes when I don't forget, apparently I do forget sometimes. Just apologies to Lost. We have to go back. Uh, we have to go back. Lost Revisited. Apologies. But yeah, you can hear my voice on various podcasts. I, I love guest hosting and uh, I love uh, talking about TV and movies and everything else. Exactly. So that's that's our show. And I just want to thank everybody for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this was Panels to Pixels. And we'll see you on the next panel. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Good night.